turning it off and on again? Uh, we tried rebooting, we turned it off and on again. I excellent, don't know. excellent. So, uh, we had some bets running on how many people it was going to take to make the slides work earlier down here in the front row. Uh, so uh, Glenn and I are super excited to be here today. Um, uh, just a quick intro. I am Scott Hunter, uh, the Vice President of Product at Microsoft on the Azure Developer Experience team. Man. I've got Glenn with me, uh, who is the Product Manager for uh, project manager lead, I should say, on .NET, especially ASP.NET. Yeah. Uh, Glenn and I were both part of the journey uh, of rebooting .NET into .NET Core uh, starting around 2014. So that was both, uh, he and I went through that entire journey together, and today we're here to talk about uh, a lot of the stuff we're doing in .NET 8. 8. It's been a long journey getting there. From the thing that we called Project K that we didn't know what it was <laughs> uh, many years ago. Okay. So, um... I just want to head off and start. Uh, we, we brought like 100 slides yeah. and uh, a lot of demos. Yeah. And so it doesn't all fit in the keynote. Yeah. And so what we're going to do is whatever doesn't fit in the keynote today, we're going to overflow into Glenn's session um, at Yeah. If you have more slides than there are minutes in a talk, you probably have a problem if any of you are creating presentations in the future. Um, yeah. OK. And then we press next several so with, times. With, you have with, to press with that, um, you know, I've been doing .NET since 2002. So um, I was there at the first PDC uh, when Scott Guthrie introduced ASP Plus um, and what became ASP.NET and .NET. Yeah. And uh, uh, we've, we've gone through a long journey. And it's amazing that uh, 20 years in, we have 6.1 million developers. Um, for almost every year, forever, we've now been in the... In the, in the uh, yeah, uh, the most loved framework yeah, on Stack Overflow. Third, I think, was the lowest we ever got, and I'm pretty sure we're top again now in the latest, the latest one, most loved, thanks to you all loving it, apparently. And then, uh, you know, we've, we've taken a ton of contributions, over 50,000 contributions in .NET over the years, and that's pushed us up into uh, the top five as the most highest velocity OSS projects uh, that the Cloud Native Foundation, they run a survey every, every month, yeah. our query that does this, yeah. and we're the top five languages in GitHub. So... I'm you know, also constantly amazed at the quality and the level, and it doesn't matter where it is. People are making contributions to the garbage collector, to the runtime, like all over the place, and it's great. Right. So um, happy to be open source and, and, and there. Yeah. Uh, this is kind of crazy. So a lot of people ask, you know, why would you use .NET? Um, one, of the, one of the best reasons to use .NET is because we at Microsoft use a lot of .NET. Um, some of these stats are crazy. Um, Azure Active Directory, 185 billion requests a day. Um, Microsoft Teams, if you're using Microsoft Teams, the entire back end is written in .NET. Um, Azure App Service, we ported uh, their infrastructure to, to .NET, the new .NET 6 and 7. Recently, 80% throughput improvement yep. uh, when we did that. Uh, we were able to do gRPC and HP2 yeah. because we were using our, yeah, our, our web proxy. .NET YARP is now the proxy that all of the Azure App Service traffic goes through. So .NET, you, you go through a .NET piece of infrastructure to get to any app service, regardless of what it's running, uh, which is cool. But basically, all the big things at Microsoft run on .NET. And because of that, um, it just means that the .NET that you use is very battle-tested and ready for any workload. Yeah. Um, and many of these teams actually are running our nightly builds as well um, because they want the performance improvements because in, yeah. in Azure and in Microsoft, you know, a 5% performance improvement might be $10 million or $50 million savings per year. Yeah, we um, get called the day after a PR by someone in exchange sometimes saying, hey, you just regressed the performance by 3%. Uh, <laughs> then it's great. We usually fix them the next day, so you all never even see them, which is cool. Yeah, so Exchange actually takes nightly builds from us, and yeah. uh, they run, I think, at least three nightly builds through their pipeline at any moment in any time. Any time, yeah. Um, Super advanced testing infrastructure is, is how they pull that off, by the way. They know it's broken before it ever gets to production. Yeah. Um, and it just, you know, we're going to talk mainly about .NET 8 today, um, but we, we always want to look back and say, you know, .NET 7 is a great release, um, much, much better Linux support. Um, it was the first version of .NET that actually was natively in Red Hat. Mm -hmm. um, it's, we've been in Red Hat for every release since uh, .NET Core 1.0, yes. but we had to help them build it. It's the first time they could build it build themselves. It themselves. Yeah. Um, and then we've done a lot of work on uh, great ARM64 support uh, on, on Linux uh, and .NET as well. Yeah. The Red Hat thing's a big deal because it proves that, you can, that anybody could take a .NET and build their own version of it and ship it in their own thing, because it's a requirement to be in the Red Hat Package Manager, is 
they have to be able to build it themselves, service it themselves, and, and such in order to get into the official thing. And it's, so it's proof to us that that can be done. Um, and because as we all know, until you've implemented something three times, uh, you don't know if your abstraction works. And that's where we were at. Um, other big things in .NET 7, obviously, was .NET MAUI was a big part of .NET 7. Yeah. Uh, it's our native, uh, native uh, stack for building applications across all devices. Yeah. Uh, another one that uh, was a big one for us was uh, the simplified C Sharp that we did in .NET 7, mm -hmm. meaning that you could basically have a main, we actually just have a, a, a program.cs yeah. and uh, just start writing code with no usings, no mains, none of that stuff. Yeah. That might not be for you, um, but and we'll, Glenn and I'll talk about this later, but it, was, it was primarily if you, if you learn Python or Node.js first and you come to .NET, you're like, why is it so complicated? Um, and we were trying to address that it was um, me, and I'm a C-sharp developer, so... Um, and then a bigger one, too, is uh, we have this, a feature called DevTunnels, which means if you have code running in the cloud, we can actually let yep. you run it, proxy it to your local machine, yeah. uh, and so you can do breakpoints in, in, in live URLs. Um, and then my favorite is you can actually build native containers in .NET. So .NET does not require Docker for desktop on the machine or any other tools. We can build containers right out of the gate. Um, and so th those are some of the quick highlights I'd have on .NET 7. Is there anything I missed, Glenn? No, I think on the container thing that the, if, you, if containers, peop, some people think containers are going to become the unit of deployment. That's a thing you're going to produce all the time for all your server-side apps. And we said, well, if that's the case, then they're like zip files or binaries or exes. Why can't .NET produce them just like it can, zip files or binaries or exes? And that support is, the, uh, is a culmination of that thinking where, okay, if this thing is ubiquitous and you need to do it all the time, let's just make it as easy as humanly possible, right? And it's very cool, I think. And so with that, um, you know, I can't, uh, you know, being a Microsoft employee, I can't start yeah. any presentation without talking about AI and intelligence a little bit. Yeah. Um, it seems to be the, the thing that we talk about today. Yeah. Satya approves. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we kind of believe that uh, AI is going to help define the developer experience all up. Um, and we're going to show some stuff today about how you can actually put AI in your applications. But we're going to start on the tooling side. Um, this is something we, uh, we uh, announced at Build, uh, and I'm super happy about it, which is uh, we have GitHub Copilot. Uh, it's been out for a while in GitHub, um, and we now have extensions for it in VS Code, um, and we have a, an extension for it in Visual Studio as well. So no matter what tool from Microsoft you're using, yeah. uh, we have full um, Copilot support. Audience participation? Are any of you using Copilot? I can see you because I have this magic hat, but otherwise I can't see anything. Yeah, no. Okay, great. So There's no, no much usage here then. You should try this. It's amazing. For all so you so uh, Co I, I will tell you, Copilot does not take your source code and put it in the cloud or do anything no. like that at all. It's, it's all built on, on logic. It's learned from the cloud. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's basically an assistant for a developer. Yeah. And I've got this great video from uh, Scott Hanselman on my team uh, that really kind of shows you some of the big highlights of what you can do with Copilot. In this case, we're showing in Visual Studio. Works great in Visual Studio Code, this is um, Studio Code. And, and everywhere else. So uh, we believe that uh, um, we actually took a bunch of developers, gave them Copilot for a few weeks, um, and came back and surveyed them and asked them. And they said they could code about twice as fast. Developers were happier. Um, and they wrote yeah. a lot more code uh, yes. with Copilot. Yeah. And so uh, for that, let me show a, a quick demo of Copilot. It's real good at writing code that I didn't want to write anyway. Right. Copilot gives you new and powerful conversational AI assistance in Visual Studio going beyond completion. It gives you insights into your code, such as analysis and explanation, and even fixes in some cases, based on what we know about what you're doing at the time. I can easily ask Copilot questions in my natural language right in line my code. It'll use the code context to come up with intelligent analysis and suggestions. VS helps gather the right context and form a good question to get great answers. I can get a little deeper into the conversation and drill in on any question I ask in this convenient chat window. I've been asked to maintain this class basket service, and I'm trying to get my head around it. Copilot can help. And Copilot's Copilot explaining what the code does. a natural language explanation that gives me a head start. I can drill into the chat with Copilot and ask, how would I call it? I can get some sample calling code that will help me understand usage even more. Now, I've been told that this particular method is troublesome sometimes, so I'm going to drill in and try to understand it better. I can ask Copilot, what does this do, step by step? And I'll get a clear, natural language explanation. I wonder if Copilot can offer me any suggestions on what could go wrong. Copilot gives me a list of possible issues that I should think about. Now, if I ask it, 
help me fix those. It'll actually offer code to trap the problems it identified. Can you fix these issues? Later, I verified the code's working for me, and I want to lock in my gains with some unit tests. I'll start typing add unit, and notice it offers a convenient way to ask the question I want without me typing anymore. Now I'll click the generate tests button, and Copilot generates a nice set of tests, even including mocking a key service. Now in the near future, we're experimenting to take this even further. Now to illustrate our direction here while I'm debugging, when I'm stopped in the debugger, Copilot can use carefully selected parts of the knowledge that it has from that context to provide me with hints, explanations of stack traces and exceptions, and even propose fixes at the issue at hand. Here, it proposes a fix to my code's unhandled exception that'll actually work. What's helpful is that Copilot has let me know that there's a property I can use to see if the response has indeed already started. Now with this information, I can do a quick review of the new code. This looks great. If I wanted, I could preview, apply these code changes directly to the middleware, and with the power of hot reload, just keep going, debugging my fix in place. So far, Copilot has helped me figure out how a key class worked, found issues in it, helped me write tests, fixed them all, offered suggestions, and been my guide along the way. And this is just scratching the surface of what Copilot can do today and tomorrow. We hope you have as much fun using it as we've had building it. What do people think? Yeah? You like that? Yeah. So I said, I'm, I'm super excited about this. We had uh, a person on the team that wanted to write a web server over the weekend. And using Copilot, they were able to write a web server in just a couple of hours over a weekend. And so if you've not tried Copilot, I really recommend uh, trying it. You, if you're using Visual Studio, go to the Visual Studio Extension Gallery um, and search for Copilot, and you can add it right there. If you're in VS Code, go to the extensions as well, and you can add it right there as well. So it's in both those places. Yeah. Mads Torgerson, the language designer for C Sharp, has this story he tells where he first installed uh, Copilot and he forgot about it. And then he got an email from someone saying, hey, this is really, here's a code snippet in Python. It's real elegant. Can you tell me why the C Sharp version isn't as elegant as this? And he said, okay, well, let me go paste the Python in to see whether or not so that I can remember what it is. And then he was about to start typing the C sharp and the copilot just said, oh, you want C sharp for this? And just filled in the rest of the page. And he was like, yeah, that is what I wanted to do. Thank you very much, copilot, good job. And just replied to the email. Uh, it's cool, I think. And you just, you just kind of forget about it and then it comes up again and you're like, wow, that was really good. Um, before I show the next demo, I want to um, um, talk about a tool that we call the Azure Developer CLI. Um, and it's important because the demo I'm going to show, this is the tool you'll use to run that demo if you want to run the demo. Yeah. Um, and what Azure Developer CLI does is it can take a GitHub repo and you can just say AZD up and it will go make all the resources in Azure for you. Um, and, then you can, and, and then it will copy your app to the cloud and get it running. And then you can say AZD monitor and it will go and show the monitoring page for you. And so it makes getting an app into Azure really, really simple. And we're, we're taking, taking, changing all of our templates and, and uh, tutorials and mapping them to this. And the next tutorial or the next demo, um, you can run yourself uh, using AZD. Yeah. You're trying to make a thing for developers to interact with the cloud rather than like operations people for to interact with the cloud, right? Hence the D in the, in the name. And uh, I think that's very cool. So you just saw Copilot. And the question most of our developers ask us is how do we do this with our code? Um, and so, um, I want to talk about, you know, what our goals are. Um, we want to make sure that any .NET developer can use AI. We added ML.NET into .NET years ago uh, for classic machine learning. Um, and part of my team takes things like the OpenAI SDK and we port it to all languages. So we ported it to Java, we ported it to .NET, uh, we ported it to Python and, and uh, JavaScript. Um, because OpenAI, some of their SDKs are in JavaScript, some of them are in Python, they're not all in all those things. So we're, we want to make sure that uh, we give you all of those, that, that access to those, those, those tools. The next thing we want to do is we want to make sure that you can build uh, uh, awesome OpenAI plugins for anything. And so you'll see a, a big focus from us is going to be letting you build your own plugins so you can use OpenAI technologies with your data and your things. Uh, and then of course we want to show you how to build these applications. So over this, the next six months, we're gonna release probably five different samples of how to use AI in your existing applications. And so with that, um, I wanna talk about a, a demo we did at Build uh, that's at our developer conference in May. 
Um, and we used a bunch of Azure features here. We used cognitive search, and I'll explain why in a, in a second. And we used it to, technically to index your data. Um, we use speech. Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a service we have, a cognitive service, and it'll do speech to text. And so you can actually talk to an application right through your microphone. We used OpenAI. Um, and we used OpenAI to basically let you do that chat style response that you've all played with chat GPT. Um, and we actually used one more of these. We used Form Recognizer, uh, which can take any document you have and turn it into regular text that we can use as a programmer. Yeah. And so the app we built is, you know, chat GPT is great. It's fun to play with, but it's literally looking at a snapshot of the internet that was taken some time ago. Yeah. In many cases, you want to ask those same questions about the data that you own. Yeah. Um, and so this application that we're gonna build or show, um, basically we take your data, um, we're gonna then use AI and give you a chat-based interface uh, for that. And so, uh, and once again, it, in our case, it's not very applicable to Spain because uh, you don't have health plans really, but uh, um, in America we have health plans. And so uh, the idea here is we took all the documents from a fictitious health plan uh, and we were able to make, put, put them in Azure and you can ask any question you want about those documents. And so here's kind of the, the, way, with, the way this works is, first we take all your documents and we import them into an Azure storage account. Uh, we just need some place that we can go and find them. Um, then we take the documents and we use Azure Cognitive Search to index them. And we do that because we have to take a, we want to take all those documents and create a blob that we can then send to, to OpenAI. Yeah. Uh, and so what's going to happen next is you're going to have a UI. And in that UI, you're going to ask a question. And when we do that, um, we're going to go and do a search and find the most relevant documents and uh, bring some of the text back for that. Um, and you'll actually be able to even open the document that, you, that we actually indexed uh, to do that. Um, and so as you can see here, we use AI to extract the information from the documents and generate the response. Um, and then we uh, return those, those, those responses back to the, to the actual UI. Yeah. yeah if, you want, if you wish that you could ask the AI questions about stuff that's inside your firewall, this is what you want to do. And you can do it to your existing app, so you can do it to a new app, build a new thing. Like, but um, this, is, this is, we think, We've been told this is what a lot of people want to do with AI initially is like, okay, I've got that big database of stuff. How do I ask questions of it as well as the internet? And so this is the demo for you if you're in that spot. So if you want to try this, you can just uh, take a picture of the URL here. The deck will be available later today as well. Yep. AK.ms slash AI microservice, uh, microservice demo. Mm -hmm. um, and that will give you a .NET application that we're just going to show off in a second here. Yeah. So let's go over. We also, I believe, have a video embedded uh, already with a Spanish voiceover showing you some of this as well from Luis and my team. Um, so if you want to watch the video uh, in Spanish, you can as well. It's in the deck. It will be in the deck for you. So here, here is the actual demo uh, in, in uh, GitHub that you can grab from that URL. Uh, it's written in C Sharp, so you can actually download the entire thing and you can AZD up it once you're done. Um, Another thing you can do, uh, which is kind of cool, is I can also fork this into my repo. And I'll select myself. And I'll say create a fork. And now I've got a copy of that source code in my repo. Thinking, thinking, thinking. Um, I can then go to the Azure portal. Um, and we have a feature called apps, app spaces. And so instead of even doing AZD, I can go right to start deploying and I should be able to... So you could have gone to the command line and done AZD up and that would work as well. Or you could come here and choose to do this, whichever you like prefer is basically... Yep, so I select my GitHub organization. I select the repo that I just built, the main branch. It's gonna analyze it and say, yep, I can deploy that for you, Scott. Um, I give it a name and I happen to know that I probably wanna do East US here and I can press deploy and we'll take that entire application, get it running for you. We'll create all the Azure resources. Uh, we're not gonna do that now because um, we don't have time to do that. Right. Uh, but here is the actual running app afterwards. Um, and so I've got a couple things I can do here. Um, I'm not gonna do the voice thing on stage, but uh, we're using the speech API so I could click on the microphone and just talk to my computer. Uh, but I can th say things like uh, write C-sharp code. C3, we should call it that. 
to solve pi to 30 digits. Oh man, I do that a lot every day. I do it all, all the time as well, yeah. Um, I, I was joking with Glenn earlier, in Python it's one line of code and you're gonna see .NET requires a, a lot more lines of code. Um, yeah. And so um, this application will let you actually do chat GPT style stuff mm -hmm. uh, where it'll go and use the knowledge of the internet, the knowledge of GitHub uh, to go and write code for you uh, if you want. But it gets more interesting when I come over here and now what I'm doing is I'm, this is the, the thing I just talked about. I've got my data in the cloud, in my storage account, and uh, I wanna say, uh, let's do that. What's included in my, in my uh, health plan? Hmm. And so it's gonna go look at the documents, all the PDFs, um, all the Word docs that we generated, uh, or we put into the storage account, and it's gonna build me a response based on that. Uh, now what's cool here is it also, as I said before, because it's your documents, um, I can then say, it's saying, well, the, the citations say it came from uh, this, this PDF. PDF. I can click the PDF, yeah. and we'll open and show you the actual source document that actually caused the response to happen. I can go back here, uh, because it is a chat, and I could say, what about my dental options? Mm. We all like the dentist. Yeah, so if I make one of these, and then I point all of Microsoft's documents at it, could I ask it how to get a raise? Would that, would that work? You could actually do that. There you go. And so in this case, it came back and, and gave me more cri detailed criteria on that. But also notice, not only did it do that, but it, but it also offered me other options. Hey, I can, I can do follow-up questions. Well, what's, what's the visual uh, coverage that I have? Mm. Um, and so this is also all dialable. And so I can come over here, bring this out, and I can say, um, you know, how many documents from the search? Do I want to exclude stuff? Do I want to use semantic ranker? There's a bunch of options, and the, and the sample lets you try these things if you want to. Yeah. Uh, but the idea here is this is your documents, not the internet. Uh, you can build this app today in .NET. We built the Open SDK, OpenAI SDKs to make this available. Uh, just go to that URL that I showed, yeah. um, and you can do that. Yeah, that's good. Do any of you want to do this? Have you been thinking about this and desperately wishing that ChatGPT knew all about you? No? Okay. Okay. And so with that, we're going to switch over, let's not do that, yep. uh, and talk about C-sharp 12. Yes, okay. Do you want to switch machines or yes. do you want to use yours? I'm going to switch machines. Let's switch machines. Nothing could possibly go wrong. Luckily, we're not doing any more audio, so we no. don't have to worry about the audio anymore. Just need HDMI to work. So if HDMI works, we will be happy. Let's try it and find out. Out the back there, the audiovisual people are swearing. I can feel it. Um, I can feel them death staring me as, as we speak. Okay. Now. Am I mirroring? I am. Cool. There we go. Look at that. It's a sad state of affairs when plugging in a HDMI cable gets us a round of applause. Can everybody see this in dark mode? Does it need to be in light mode? Should it be in light mode? No. Yeah, you were blinded there. by the light. Okay. Yeah. We couldn't do it in light mode. Light, the light attracts the bugs. It never, the demo never would have worked. So this is, this is really cool, Glenn. Yeah. Um, so what... for those of you who haven't seen this, this is Sharp Lab I.O. You can go to it if you want. So on the left is C Sharp that you can type. And on the right over there is kind of what the compiler might generate of like so the C Sharp code that, might, that kind of gets generated. You could also get it to show IL. You could get it to show uh, a lot of details about what the code actually is. So, so IL is actually what we, we turn .NET into. So when the compiler yeah. basically takes your source yeah. code and creates IL, you can show the IL if you want, Glenn. Yeah, is it? No, no, I can't apparently. Maybe uh, I'll reboot the machine. Ready? Boom. <laughs> There we go. Look at that. And so, uh, yeah, you can, you, can, you can also run the code in here, but you can see the IL. So this is actually what, we what, what the C-sharp compiler converts your code into yeah. um, that the jitter then converts into machine code and to run your .NET application. So if you're super curious about what that turns into, 
yeah. you can do that. Right. So the reason I like it in C Sharp, we might run this code later, but I wanted to just show the generated code because, uh, well, we'll start here and then we'll get into the main method thing. We'll definitely talk about the main method. But I'm going to start with a C Sharp 12 feature about talking about primary constructors. So a primary constructor, like some of you who do C Sharp might think, like, what is this? I was going to say, do you notice the constructor is, is on the class? What is this? Now, you can do that to some things if you've been following along with some of the latest C-sharp versions. But if you haven't, this is probably completely alien to you, and that's fine. So these are called primary constructors. You can do them in a limited form in some of the earlier versions of C-sharp. And in C-sharp 12, we've kind of genericized that feature. So you can use them all over the place. You could use them on classes like we are here. And so the difference between a primary constructor, one of the big differences between a primary constructor and a normal constructor is see this C-sharp generated code? Or see here, I'm using presenter down here. I've got this talk object, it takes a string and it takes a collection of ratings that you all are gonna give to the, to, to the presenter. And then down here I'm using it in, a str in string interpolation. Because in most cases, what Where's you do that with your constructor, from? I was gonna say, with your constructor, Glenn, you normally pass parameters in, yeah. and you have variables in your class that you then copy that stuff exactly. into. Yeah, private, <laughs> private, private string, like um, pre presenter or public and string. And this is automatic. Content. This is basically doing that for you automatically. So you can see what happens is over here, because I'm using a primary constructor, it's just generating a normal constructor, and then it's generating these backing fields, and then it's assigning them inside the generated constructor so that they're available throughout the rest of the code. And the rule is, any, any new constructors you add have to call the primary constructor eventually. It's impossible to construct this class without invoking the primary constructor, this constructor. So hence the name. Does that make sense? Cool. Do you like it? Is this a good feature? You like this? Yeah, it's okay. Someone said it's okay. It's okay. Yeah, yeah okay. If it was JavaScript, he would have loved it. <laughs> and Natalia. Hmm. Our goal is to have you write less code. And so instead of having to write those, those, those private yeah. variables and do the copying and stuff like right. that, this, this erases that. Yeah, exactly. And you can see it, like if I was to copy this into another constructor, this code would break. It wouldn't compile anymore and stuff like that. So then let's start using this thing. Let's say like var, I don't know, speaker equals new talk or something like that. Let's say, uh, no, I don't want to do that. Stop trying to help. Hunter, who, uh, let's see, new integer array, who will use, collect, will use a uh, collection initializer? Who has some scores for Hunter? How's he been doing so far? Who wants to yell some out? Numbers, integers? 1,000. One? 1,000? OK. <laughs> someone said one, someone said 1,000. A little bit of variance in these scores. That's all right. OK. Typical, uh, typical uh, uh, responses, though, I guess. <laughs> OK, so now I have this integer array, and I'm going to pass it into the primary constructor, and that's all cool. And I could, you know, I could do console.writeline. You know, um, I could do console.writeline speaker, right? And then I could run this over on the left-hand side if I wanted to. If I could spell, instead of saying speller, speaker, <laughs> then the code would compile. And so now, now over here, I could run this and it would run and everything would be fine, but like, trust me. And so you're, you're uh, I just want to say something here. This is, that, this is the new syntax, Glenn, that we did in, yeah. in, in Dutch. Yeah, so this is a fully functioning console application on the left. And if you compile this, you get a binary, you run it. It just works, right? And so for those of you who haven't been playing along at home with the newer versions of C Sharp, where's the main method? How do I know? Well, and you can see it's on the right-hand side over here. There is still a program main. We just made it up for you. Because why do you need to tell us? We know that everything that you write in the top of this program, if you've got a file called program.cs and you've got some code at the top of it, it's the code that you want to run when you run the program CS. Why do I have to also make up the class name and tell you the thing and do the stuff, right? But if you want to do pressed, uh, uh, static void main because you love it, feel free to throw it in, nothing breaks, but you don't have to. And so yeah, you can see over here, this is just, a, this is the code that's generating. It is, I've got a program, I've got my main method, it's creating the array, it's assigning some values, it's creating the type. It's exactly the code that you would have written a few versions of the language ago, which like shows you the evolution and how the compiler, and none of this requires IL or runtime changes, it's compiler magic to try to make you more productive. So you just have, so you write as little of the code you don't care about as possible and as much as the code that is interesting as possible. And so let's evolve this a little bit. Well, you let know? me add one more comment. So okay. our, our friendly folks at Oracle who own Java 
Yeah, are now starting to, to copy some of our things that we've done in .NET, like yeah. uh, getting rid of the mains and stuff. And so yeah, yeah. Uh, I um, think it was fun to see that them now discussing following .NET yeah, uh, indeed. versus us following Java or anything, yeah. anything else. Well, I mean, there's a little bit of go backwards and forwards, right? Like we spent, a, a, we had a one engineer go basically offline this whole year working on green threads in C Sharp in, in .NET, for example, because some of the other languages in the ecosystem. And I think there's a lot of good stuff happening across all the languages as everybody pushes each other to be better and better. Async and wait in C Sharp was amazing and a bunch of other languages have, uh, have, have gone, so. So what else is new in C Sharp? Well, there's a thing called collection initializers. So theoretically, arrays seem a little bit limiting, right? What is this, the, like the 80s? I can use an array? Surely, surely I would use a list, like a normal person, because I might want to add something to it later. Who uses arrays? What are we talking about here, right? And so now, obviously, my code up here breaks. And I'm like, OK, god damn. Now I, have, now I need to change this thing. And if I change this again, what if I could just say, make a collection, whatever type of collection this thing expects, make it that? Is that cool? Yeah. So what happens if you change the list back to what you had before? And so down here, if I make this back to an integer array, still compiles if I, if I don't uh, leave a, uh, a curly bracket and if I can spell. The code still compiles. Yeah. Either way. Because, we, and you notice that it's still doing, this is the exact same code as before. It's the same. Because the compiler knows. It knows more than I do about C Sharp, guaranteed. And so uh, it knows how to do it. And if you were to, and if you were to up here in this code, make new list, like, I, like manually, the C-sharp over here would be the same as the C-sharp that is there right now. Right? Cool. And so there's other things that happen too, right? Like you might want to say, okay, what if, I want a new, what if I want a new constructor in here that just takes, the, just takes the string, right? And then it calls, you know, calls the base constructor. How would I pass, what do I pass here? Maybe it's array.empty if I'm an animal. Maybe it's uh, ienumerable.empty. Maybe I instantiate a new list. What do I do? Well, what if you did, what if, what would, if, if a square brackets are just make a collection of whatever type I want, then what is an empty set of square brackets? It's an empty collection of whatever type I need, right? And so there's one other thing um, you will notice that is um, the other thing that is interesting here is as an operator, now this doesn't actually work yet, except on like two people's machines. And this is not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so you'll notice up here though, uh, this drop down here. So I'm actually running against a branch, a feature branch of the Roslyn compiler that has not yet been merged to main. So nothing that I've shown you is even in the main branch of the GitHub repo, let alone in the thing. Actually, take that back. I think primary constructors is in main. And <laughs> this was forked afterwards. But red hot bits. So I don't have all of the features merged in here because we split it up into feature branches and they all come back later. I was impressed that you were using European dates for the, uh, the dates. Yeah? I absolutely did. Uh, I absolutely meant to do that. 27th of June, not uh, June 27th. So yeah, it, like, a, uh, like a sane person. Okay, so uh, there's another thing you can do, and that is, let's say, um, let's say I had a new list here. I had like, this is, this is not going to compile, but this is what you could do. If I had a new, new list that was like Glenn's scores, right, like this, right, and then I put, made like a new list of int, and then, uh, you know, or I'll do, do, do something better, and I go like this, and I say like, you know, in dot max value, because, because like, what else could it be? And then Hunter is like, hey, my scores are a bit weak. Could I steal your scores? Then you could do this. And what that would do is it would grab all the values from Glenn's scores and they would just become elements of this collection. So now you've only got one collection and it contains both. Right? That's pretty cool too. Now, the other thing 
Uh, last thing, last thing, integers, what am I doing? Again, how do I know if I've got multiple? There's a few reasons why you might like this last feature. One of the reasons I like it is kind of expressiveness. Like if I've got multiple co integer collections around or tuples floating around, sometimes it's nice to give those names, but I don't want to like give int a name. I don't want to create a class for it. So what if I was to say using, I don't know, score equals int? What the hell does that do for all of you who love usings? I know there's at least one of you in this audience who loves usings more than anybody else in the world. Um, what that does is it just aliases int. So in my code, I can now use this instead of int. And you'll notice that over here, the code is still the same. It didn't change because it's just compiler trickery to allow you to be a bit more expressive in what is this thing, what did I intend to be, without actually necessarily creating a type, without a thing. But, and that's kind of like, okay, cool trick. I probably wouldn't do something like that. It starts to become a little bit more interesting when you start doing things like maybe, um, maybe it's a tuple. Now, maybe I have lots of tuples of like string int. What's a tuple, Glenn? It's a collection of uh, two, piece, two pieces of data. Uh, tuple? Tuple? Uh, how do you want to pronounce it? Like, there is, you're starting, it's the, there's a few things that you can now express where you might be referring to them a lot. Or maybe you've got like key value pair of string int and you're passing that around a bunch and you're trying to, man, I'm so sick of typing key value pair of string, of string int over and over and over again. Things like that. And you can just say, okay, in this, in this file, I use that type over and over again. Let me make up a shorthand for that type. Actually, the big reason, the reason we did tuples and we did them, I think, in C Sharp 6 was because how many people create a class because you want to return more than one value from a method or something. And yeah. so that's what tuples were created for was yeah. a way to return more than one, uh, you know, type or, yeah. or things from a, yeah. from a method without creating a, a, they also, a they fake also, class. They also feed a lot into pattern matching. If you haven't used any of the new pattern matching stuff for C Sharp, there's a bunch of really cool stuff in there that all gives you back tuples. You can deconstruct them magically and things like that. Um, yeah, so that is C Sharp. That is C Sharp 12, the, some of the features that are there. Um, one that also doesn't work on this machine is you can also now get access to the field when you're making a property getter and setter. There's some stuff to be able to let you get access to the field for an automatic property uh, and a few features like that. Um, one last call out, the C Sharp team do a really good job of telling you why they care. So if you go here to the uh, C Sharp feature specs, they have in like future features, features that as features go down a particular, get far enough along, they always write something like this, which is describes why the, what the motivation for this feature was. So if you were looking at like any of the things I just described and you're like, why did they care about that? Jump in here, have a browse and you'll find good kind of descriptions of why did we care? Why are we doing that feature? And you can go all the way back. So if you want to answer that question that Hunter just talked about, about tuples, you go back to where tuples were, have a look, the language design, why were we doing this and so on and so forth. And they're, they're pretty detailed and pretty I'm, good. I'm pretty scared. There's like C Sharp 11 features there to plan. Yeah, there are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's like, that's like years away. C Sharp 11? We're on C Sharp 12. What are you talking about? Okay, here we go. Back to the other laptop. See if Everybody, can... hold your hats and pray for me if, if you're a praying type. Thank you. Yeah. C Sharp 12, looking great. Also, Mads Torgerson uh, does a talk, because uh, maybe a couple of talks at Bill where he talks about a bunch of this stuff. So, where are you going? AOT? I think it's AOT time. AOT time. Okay, so the, uh, we'll talk about all these slides that we're skipping past in my talk later on in the day, uh, if you want to see any of them. We'll talk about Blazor, I'll do a big Blazor demo, a bunch of stuff like that. So let's talk about AOT. Uh, What's AOT and, mean? And so AOT stands for Ahead of Time Compile. That's why um, isn't that AOTC so, like, then? So think about .NET today. Is one, one of the cool benefits of .NET is we, we generate what's called IL. We showed that IL on the screen before, and yeah. when your .NET application starts up, we have what's called a jitter, uh, which is a just-in-time compile that takes that IL and converts it to machine code based on the machine that you're running on. If it's a 32-bit machine, it makes 32-bit code. If yeah. it's a 64-bit machine, it makes 64-bit code. If it's an ARM machine, it makes ARM code. So yeah. the nice thing about the jitter is um, we don't have to know the architecture of the, of the device you're going to run the code on. Um, but Build once, test anywhere, right? 
Yes. Hmm. Um, but the negative of a jitter is when the app starts up, the jitter has to run and has to do that conversion and running code, right. which means your code might start a little slower because we have to jit the yeah. code. We've always said our benchmarks have proved to us time in and time out that once we get .NET booted up, it is fast as hell. Yeah. But sometimes it takes 1,000, one, you know, one or two seconds to actually get us off the to ground boot and running. The yeah, because the JIT has to boot, has to inspect your code, it has to decide how it's going to convert the IL, what it's going to convert. The JIT actually gets very clever about deciding. Now, and so you can get faster startup speeds by not doing that, right? But if you're not going to do that, then how do you get code that's going to run? Well, then you've got to do it at compile time, hence ahead of time is the name, hence IoT. You've got to, pr you've got to build as hard as possible before you send it to the machine so that the machine doesn't need the JIT. But that also means anything that requires the JIT at runtime no longer works. So if any of you have ever used reflection, for example, that breaks a lot of AOT. And the reason for that is when you're compiling hardest, then we have to trim out as much as possible of all used code. So if you're using reflection, the compiler can't often tell what code is unused, and therefore it will just delete it. <laughs> and, and we know from hard won experience that people who use .NET and people who use Java love reflection. <laughs> they use it everywhere. And in, so, in, including us, by the way. Yeah, so, including so our, us, our, including our all of too. the framework. Yeah. So why, why, do, why in .NET do we care about AOT? Yeah. And I'll explain. There's these languages like Go and Rust that uh, have some popularity. Um, because they build single exes uh, that are super small. Yeah. Um, and we're always looking to make sure .NET is competitive in all the places. You know, we've done yeah. a lot of work the last couple of years being the best web platform. Yeah, we didn't show it, but we normally show at the very beginning of these talks the slide that says our vision is to build you, let you be a productive developer for building any app type, any platform, anywhere you want. Well, that might include the places where you really want fast startups time, really small file size, and really high throughput or something along those lines, right? Um, and if you are in a place where you really want really small file size, really, really fast cold start, say like in a, uh, in a functions type experience where you're writing some type of function that you wanted to, that is going to uh, be created from nothing to, to respond to a HTTP request, cold start becomes really, really important. You don't got time to wait around for the JIT to be able to handle the HTTP requ request, for example, right? And so that's why this is interesting. But we also don't think it's for everything. We don't. Well, also, there's another, another negative of AOT is that your compile times are much longer because yes. we have to go do a, a bunch of extra work to actually do all the thing the jitter would have done right. and stuff. So, um, you know, I think as a developer, I'd probably develop in JIT and then test on AOT. We've got ourselves in trouble with this in the past with, with Windows UWP, but yep. uh, we'll skip that. Um, yeah. Now, let's talk about, we've actually done... Um, yeah. So we've been doing AOT for a while. In, we have. We've in been .NET. making a chipping away at it for a few years. This release, um, I got an email from somebody who said, hey, we saw you were doing AOT, and we had this new thing we were spinning up, and so we thought, maybe C Sharp, maybe Go. That's who we were comparing against, right? And they were like, this is our sample app that we built. Here's the Go version. Here's the C Sharp version. Why, isn't, why is your version not better? And I said, that's a good question. This was the size of their kick, their like kick the tires, hello world app that they sent me. It was super basic. It did basically nothing. It was a HTTP request. It just returned, returned a response. Like it didn't really do much. But like the Go version was started up faster and was smaller and had better, better memory usage. And so I asked the people to fix it. And it turns out they're way smarter than me. This is where we have we got for that same uh, application. So we went from go back and then go forwards. We went from several, like hundreds of all of these to small enough to fit on a floppy disk if you tweak the settings a little bit, Wrong. basically, which I think is pretty good. Yeah, I was going to say, let's go do that again. So you look at the publish size, 88 megs for a Hello World application, down yeah. to 8 megs. And you'll notice um, these, are, these are all comparable with Go. So yeah. um, if you want to look at something like Go, Go is going to make these same size things. Working set, 33 megs of memory. Yeah. You can run a .NET app in 33 megs of memory. Uh, you can see the, the request per second, 
700,000 yeah. requests a second, yeah, you 27 notice. millisecond startup time. Exactly. Only .NET is 1,000 millisecond startup time, and so yeah. it's... it's uh, um, yeah, and so there's actually... What's the, one of the things that's interesting is um, the RPS sometimes goes down. And in the end of .NET 8, the RPS might actually be 10% less when you're AOT'd. Because there's a little bit of like, the JIT's actually good. It's really good. <laughs> and as more features happen in the JIT and it gets better and it's more adaptive, because the, one of the things the JIT can do is it can respond to how your application is being used. It knows because it's in your app whilst your app is running. And so uh, it's not, right now, there's almost no difference. You just, it seems like there's no reason what, not to AOT anything. But we're not promising that's always going to be true, especially as you get more JIT features that can understand your running app and adapt over time. But that means that perhaps the RPS of the AOT version is better in a short benchmark because it starts up really fast, so it's returning responses really quickly, so it gets a better like benchmark result. But over time, when the JIT's got time to operate, you may well start to get higher RPS as the JIT's got time, right? That's entirely possible. Not, it's not necessarily the case now. Um, and there's some new GC features coming for AO because of AOT, some adaptive GC things. There's always people working on JIT. There's a lot of, a lot of things happening in this space, and they probably will be for several years. So um, let's do a quick demo. Yeah, go for it. You so, want demo? So this is uh, an application called Cont Contoso Online that Brady Gaster, who works for Glenn, yeah. uh, built for us. It's a multi-part microservice application, yeah. and we wanted to see what would happen if we AOT'd the application. So the yeah, way I would normally start this is, is I would come over here, and I would boot it up. It's, it's got containers and stuff like that, so I'm going to do a compose up, um, and that's going to go make a bunch of containers really quick uh, mm -hmm. for us. Um, and it's currently not using AOT, so it's going to use the jitted version of this. Uh, you can see it's building my containers right now. They're all starting up. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I go over here to my uh, Docker extension, I can see these are all running. Um, I can go to the store. I can right click. I should be able to say open in browser. There's my store running. Awesome. Now let's go look at uh, the images that we have in Docker. And so, um, and let's just sort by name. And let's find the .NET stuff. Here it is. So here's like products. Actually, let's go to the right place. Um, here they are. Now notice that these are all 200 megs. 248 megs, 248 megs, 250 megs, uh, and 250 megs. These are not bad sizes. Uh, when we talk to most customers, they'd be fine with that. Most of their containers end up being this big anyway because of OS images and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but what we'll I can talk do... Talk about chiseled images later on today where you can get that stuff down as well. I can go back to VS Code and I can say, uh, let's make all those containers go away. And I'm going to just switch to my AOT branch. Um, wait for the store to stop. Do, do, do. It might be fighting because of that. Okay, so they're all gone, and I'm going to switch to my AOT branch, and in the talk later, to, later today, I'll actually show you what we changed in the application to make the act, actual apps AOT. Yeah. We don't have enough time to do that now. Yeah. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a compose up again. And this time, uh, the one thing you're going to notice is the build's going to take a little bit longer, um, because now we're actually making the native AOT images for each of those containers. And what we're going to see, uh, we can chat for a second, Glenn, because this is going to take a yeah. 30 or 40 so seconds. Where we're getting to at the end of .NET 8 hope is that you should be able to AOT basic HTTP services, um, including using data, but it won't be kind of full EF data. EF is unlikely to be done by that time. Basically, we have to go through our stack to make sure that it is capable of being AOT'd because the apps are also like, they, they, they link in everything. Right? So all of our stuff has to be able to be, to, has to work. And so we will, in .NET 8, you'll be able to do basic small HTTP services. If you've got like a little microservice that's not doing a great deal, um, and then, you can then you should probably be able to use this in your, in your solution. Um, but not everything will work, and we'll have a lot of notes and details about what will not work, what won't. We'll have a lot of guidance. We're hoping to have a lot of guidance on you know, what it means to support AOT. If any of you have libraries that you use, that you produce, that you shipped into GitHub, or that are used by multiple teams around your company, 
It also might cut the, people might also start coming to you to say your library is not AOT friendly. When I use your library, it's doing something that now stops me from AOTing my app. So there's also this long tail effect where the vast majority of NuGet probably doesn't work or it might not work, we don't know. And we've got a bunch of people going through and doing PRs to things and trying to fix that up. But it might take a while before the ecosystem catches up. And we're not going and telling people they have to go and do that. It's going to depend upon how much you all use it, basically. And so that's where we'll get to in .NET 8. So you saw that that took about a minute and a half compared yeah. to like four or five seconds to, to bring the application up. Yeah. So it, we're working a lot harder to AOT those things. Um, and now if I click refresh over here, Mm -hmm. Come on, do your thing. Did they uh, here we go. Here's, here's a 26, 26 meg, meg container. Meg. Here's yeah. a 33 meg container. Yeah. Here's a 23 meg container. Yeah. Um, so you saw that we were able to take those 250 meg containers and basically bring them down into 30 megs. Yeah. And uh, the and previous containers could run arbitrary.net code. These ones can run literally only the code that you wrote <laughs> and nothing else. Hence, it's so much smaller. But as I said, it's part of us wanting to make, you know, .NET competitive with all the, the yeah. platforms out there. We think it's yeah. important for the application. Um, and it's also, in, inside of Microsoft, we have some IoT edge cases yeah. where they require AoT-based applications because they want to yeah. make sure they're secure, meaning no code can be injected into the running application. So that's also yeah. uh, an important Let's part do. of that. Yeah. And so, yeah, this is kind of what I said. This is where we're focusing on now. This is where we're moving to in the future, bringing more and more of the stack in. Um, but we're at the moment focusing on you kind of building a backend API. Like, because once I said, as I said, because one of the most, most attractive use cases for this, one of the most attractive use cases of this is that kind of functions -y scenario, which is over there, as opposed to, you know, full Blazor apps over here. And yeah. .NET 9, we'll take more steps. We'll, we'll do more stuff, more of this stuff on, the right, on this side of moving going on. Like, we'll just keep progressing. It's been a few years, it's going to be more. But, that, but that's also going to depend upon how you all use it and how quickly it starts getting picked up, right? We'll do as much as needed uh, and, and no more, ideally, right? Cool, okay, is so that everything then? So we have covered uh, Copilot X. We have covered building intelligent applications yeah. um, with... OpenAI yeah. and .NET. Uh, we covered C Sharp 12. Yeah, we covered, look at all that. We covered AOT. <laughs> um, and if you want to come back at uh, 1555, yeah. we're going to we're going to do uh, we're going to talk about the C Sharp Dev Kit. Yeah, that's the new uh, extension for VS Code that gives you more VS Code capabilities in .NET. Solution we're going to talk Explorer about Explorer in VS Code if you haven't seen it. Or we're we're going to talk about uh, Blazor. And we, uh, it's, I'm going to use the old term. I call it, it was called, the, the, the first version that Steve Sanderson called this was Blazor, Blazor Unified, Blazor where you can decide what code runs on the server, what code runs on the client. Yeah. And uh, Glenn's going to show that you can actually run in automatic mode where it kind of yeah. can decide on the fly. And you can choose how much or how little of all that you want to do. It's pretty um, fancy. We'll show .NET MAUI um, and a couple of other things. So yeah. uh, we're out of time for this session, but find us later today and we'll do the yeah, second we'll part here. of this. We're going to at least be here till uh, 1555, so <laughs> come and say hi if you have any questions. We'll and Glenn and I will be walking around, so if you have any questions about anything we showed or anything we yeah. haven't shown, yeah. please come find us. Um, have a great .NET 2023, and thanks for having both of thank us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having us here. I'm pretty sure I just finished doing a magic trick in that photo. <laughs>